We have casting, switching, members. Okay, whoa, this just got overwhelming super fast. As someone that has learned Blueprint using YouTube videos and the Unreal documentation, and someone that's taught a ton of people Blueprint, it's become increasingly clear that there's too many tutorials out there that teach people how to make something specific, they don't explain the nodes, or why they're doing something. So the user goes through and makes the blueprint with them, and while it is helpful, at the end of the day they don't have an understanding of why they did half the stuff they just did. Also, side note, all that movement right there, to my, to my left, your right, all baby kittens. Anyway, I've made this series as a solution to that. I'm gonna be doing my best to make you understand Blueprint so that way you can take other people's code and then change it to work for your game or get to the point where even you can make the systems you want without having to use external resources. For my first lesson, we are going to change how you think about Blueprints. No longer are you going to think about them as a bunch of code or however it is you think about them, they're containers and i want you to start visualizing blueprints as containers i'm sure you've made several blueprints where you add a static mesh maybe add a point light and then you went and you added a bunch of code which that's not really coming in come on there we go yeah you added a bunch of code or blueprint nodes and then you threw it all in and you had a container full of stuff and it just did things. And once you had that container full of stuff, you could then take it and spread it around and each instance of it acted like the last. Well, let's break down what's inside this container so we can start by understanding what the parts even are. Each thing I put in here is considered a component. The static mesh is a component the point light I added is a component, but the thing is, with each component, the camera's not gonna pick this up, I can tell you that right now, uh, there is a set of details. Details from transform, visibility, intensity, attenuation radius. You might not know what each of those means, but each component has a set of details. And last but not least, the scary part, the blueprint or the code. Believe it or not, the blueprint or the code is simply affecting the components and their details. So let's throw all our components back into the blueprint and let's do a real example. No ads, earlier content, ask me questions and even get a Discord call with me to help with your game. These are all on my Patreon right now. I'm going to hit control space. I'm gonna head back to my content folder. I'm going to create a new folder and I'm going to name this Brandon underscore blueprints. I'll open that up and now I'm going to create a blueprint class. Now, for now, don't worry too much about these. These are uh, the parents of the blueprint we're going to be creating. Just note that when we create a blueprint, the parent we choose is the uh, attributes we're inheriting. If that sounds like Spanish, don't worry. We're not worried about that right now. For now, go ahead and just click on actor. For naming convention purposes, it's highly recommended you start this with BP underscore, then the name of the blueprint. I'm going to name mine magic box. Now, this file here is the container that I was using as an example. Let's open the container and take a look inside. At first, it might seem like a lot. But if you take a look on the left-hand side, we have our components. If you look on the right-hand side, you can see the details of the selected component. Then here in the middle, if we click on the event graph, you'll see the blueprint or code. I'm gonna grab these bottom two for now and just hit the delete key. But before we do too much in the event graph, let's go back to the viewport. The viewport is essentially, if I took this blueprint here and I tipped it forward you could see all the components inside that's essentially what the viewport is it's giving you the visual representation 
of what you're creating. So let's add something that we can see to better get the point across. On the left hand side, under the word components, you'll see that we can add a component. Let's go ahead and add a static mesh. Now, first, you'll note that we need to rename it. Static meshes, the naming convention tends to be SM and then underscore, and then I'll just put a magic box because that's what my static mesh is going to be. And you'll note that nothing was added to the viewport. That is because when you add a static mesh, you've essentially added a placeholder for the static mesh. That might sound confusing, but that's because in the details panel, we haven't selected a static mesh for that component yet. You're going to start to learn that the details panel is where all the information lies. So with this, make sure your uh, new static mesh is selected. And on the right hand side, in the details panel, if we take a look, we'll see we got these overarching categories and then underneath them are smaller categories. If we keep going down, you'll see that one of them says static mesh. And you'll see that right now nothing is selected. So if I go ahead and I open up this drop down menu, you'll see a list of every single static mesh that is currently implemented into our project. I'm going to scroll down until I find me a cube. So there we go. I found me a cube. I add it to the placeholder static mesh or the component. And now you can see the visual representation of our blueprint right here. You'll note that the grid cuts it about right in half. And the reason for that is this grid is the visual representation of the ground inside the blueprint. Now, the ground doesn't always necessarily matter, which is why it's kind of a grid see-through and we can just go right through it. However, since this is a static mesh and something we want above the ground, I'm actually gonna grab my static mesh, the component, and I'm going to pull it up until it's sitting on top of the ground. And then I'll hit save and compile. So what's the difference between saving and compiling? When you save a blueprint, you're saying, hey, take the state that the blueprint is in and save it. When you compile a blueprint, you're saying, hey, make sure my code from top to bottom is error free. So that way, when you run it, my entire computer doesn't explode. So that's why it's two different things, because you might have a bug that causes an error, but you don't want to lose everything. So that would be a save. But if you want to both make sure its state is saved as well as compile it to make sure there are no errors, that's why you compile. Now, just because you get through the compile does not mean that you will not get errors, but don't worry about that for now. We'll explain that later. So there we go. We now have a component added to our box that is a blueprint, which means that we also have access to all of its details over here on the right hand side. So let's add one more thing. Let's add the code. Let's make this box do something. This is the part where people get scared. Well, I'm here to make you know that it's not that scary, I promise. So you'll remember earlier, I deleted the other two nodes, but I left the event begin play. Event begin play is an event that happens whenever the game starts or something is spawned in. That's two different things. When the game starts, if everything is already present, event begin play will go. But let's say an enemy spawns in and the player has been playing for a while, event begin play will still fire for that individual blueprint once it's spawned in. Okay, that's cool and all, but how do we get the box, this magic box, to do anything. Well, do you remember how I said you're going to learn that almost everything has to do with these details? While that's only about 90% true, watch how much we can do with just these details. So let's take a look over here. We have the transform and we have a rotation. Okay. Well, what if we rotate it along the Z? Let's rotate it just a little bit here. You'll note that it rotated. What if I put it back at zero? Okay, so we can rotate the box using its transform, specifically the rotation. Interesting. So what if out of the event begin play, I pull out and I type in the word rotation? Uh-oh, 
We're getting all kinds of stuff. We have add local, we have set, we have casting, switching, members. Okay, whoa, this just got overwhelming super fast. But let's discuss why. When I pull this out, you'll note that it says executable actions and it's context sensitive. Well, if you think about it, the only context we've given it is event begin play. We are pulling directly from this node and it has to think about every possible thing that could come out of that event begin play. So there's gonna be a lot of stuff. So let, let's change our approach. Because we now know that it's context sensitive, what if I got a reference to the box somehow? Well, luckily you can do that. If we just simply pull the box onto the event graph. Okay, now we've taken the context to every possibility down to what can I do with this box? So let's pull out of that. Now you'll note the list seems just as large as previously, but that's because we haven't searched anything. Let's type in the word rotation again, rotation. Oh my gosh, look how much smaller this list got. We can get its relative ro uh, rotation, its absolute rotation. We can add a local rotation, a relative, world, get socket, get world rotation. There's still a fair bit here, but it got way, way lower. So what if we set the relative location? Now you're probably wondering, what is the difference between a relative and a world location? Well, Let's head to the viewport. As you can see, right now the rotation is set to zero within the blueprint. That is its local rotation. If I went to the map or our level and I drug my magic box, which now you can see is simple. All we have to do is take the container, the blueprint, drag it into the world. You'll see that it starts pretty squared up with everything. That's because it's local rotation is zero. But if I was to then rotate it, I'm changing it's, I'm changing the world rotation right now, okay? It's local rotation is still zero. So think of the blueprint as a whole, okay? And to better represent this, let's add a second box. So I'm just gonna grab it, hit control D, which is duplicate. And I'm gonna bring this one over to here, okay? And I'm gonna hit save and compile. Now, you'll note that the blueprint now encompasses, as you can see, both boxes. And to better show you what local rotation is versus world rotation, watch what happens when I rotate this box now. Note that the entire thing is rotating, the entire blueprint. Okay, because we're rotating the blueprint as a whole. I'm basically just doing this. Okay. So everything within the basket or the blueprint is rotating as one because we're changing the world rotation. Now, if I reach in here and I grab the static mesh and I spin it, this is its local rotation, okay? That's because if you notice, the basket's not spinning anymore. The blueprint doesn't necessarily, like all these components don't care, okay? We're only spinning the static mesh. So that's its local rotation, or I'm sorry. Yeah, that's its local rotation. But if I pick the whole thing up and I spin the whole thing, that's its world rotation, okay? So I'm gonna head back into my basket or blueprint and I'm gonna delete the duplicated box and just go back down to the single box. I'll save and compile. Okay, so with our box here, let's go ahead and pull out and I'm gonna type in rotation. And we're gonna set the world rotation, okay? But you'll note that it's one blue and two it needs something to happen in order for this node to run 
Note the blueprints are split into two basic types of nodes. There's more types than two, but you're going to be using the two primarily. You have events. Those are red. These are the things that happen, which make your code run. So for example, event begin play. When the game starts or something is spawned, we know that event begin play will happen. It's an event. So let's plug in the begin play to setting the world rotation. Okay. I'm going to grab these top two like this, by the way, and press Q and it'll straighten out that line. So now you'll see the event begin play. We're going to set the world rotation. The target is our static mesh magic box. Okay. Let's go ahead and go see what the rotation is. I'm not going to touch it. For me, the rotation right now is set to 20. Because remember, this is the world rotation because it's in the world and we're spinning the whole blueprint. It's set to 20 right now. Okay. So I have it set to zero in the actual code. So I'm going to hit save and I'm going to hit compile. Okay. Now let's, let's see what happens when I hit play. You'll note that this yaw or the Z for the blueprint is tilted right now. It's turned. When I hit play, watch what happens. Notice it's completely straight. It has completely squared up with the rest of the map. And then if I hit escape, it goes back to being turned. We added a static mesh component. We told the component what static mesh to be in the details panel to help us better find what we're looking for. We drag a reference down into the event graph and we pulled out of that reference. We knew we could affect its details. So we went in and we said, hey, I want to set its world rotation and I want to set it to zero. But we didn't know when that was going to happen. However, there's an event begin play. So we knew whenever the game starts or something spawns in, this event happens. And thus, we could plug it in to our world rotation. And therefore, the box is now squared up and at zero on the yaw. And now, if we drag in the magic box and we just start rotating them randomly, you'll note that every single one of these is now going to act exactly the same. When I hit play, they're all perfectly squared up. Now, this doesn't have a lot of practical use, you're probably thinking to yourself, but this episode was to get you to fully understand the basics of what a blueprint is. The biggest takeaway, blueprints are containers, okay? And you put components into the container and you use the coder blueprint to affect the components details within the container. Next episode, we're going to discuss what happens if you have two containers, because as you can see, they can't see inside of each other. So how does this container communicate with this one when it can't see what's even happening inside of it? If you enjoyed this episode, please like, comment, and subscribe. I'm going to continue to make these. I'll see you in the next one.